Thank you all for coming to this event today, um, sponsored by the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. Um, this event on Russian media, um, uh, we have two speakers uh, talking about um, the way in which the war in Ukraine has been portrayed in Russian media today. Um, the first is William Nickel, who is Associate Professor of Russian Literature at the University of Chicago. Um, He's been teaching a course focused on Russian media and censorship for many years, and he recently had to rename this course Media and Power in the Age of Putin and Trump. Um, he'll be giving us a closer look at what Russians are seeing on state-run media today. Um, we also have a visiting with us from, um, from Madison, right, Anton? Um, Anton Shurikov, who is a PhD candidate in comparative politics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he's working on media politics, misinformation, and perceptions of media in autocracies. And his other work explores contemporary political institutions and authoritarian legacies in the post-communist space. Before his time at uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Anton was a journalist and editor um, at Sloan.ru, um, among other outlets, covering business and politics in Russia. Um, he obtained his master's degree from the European University at St. Petersburg. And I should have introduced myself. My name is Anne Aiken Moss. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures here at the University of Chicago, and I'll be the moderator today. Um, Bill, we're going to get started with your presentation. Thank you. You're okay. muted. Yeah, 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 thank you. And Anne also teaches on, on media and has uh, some background on this too. So we're looking forward to her um, participation. So there's been a lot of discussion of the Russian media coverage of the war and probably everyone here is aware of the flavor of it. So rather than talk about it, I'm going to show some images and clips and maybe that's something that people have been less exposed to. And unfortunately there won't be subtitles. I couldn't quite get the technology on that figured out, but I will translate if not word for word, some key passages. And even if you don't understand the Russian, you'll pick up a lot of body language, visual strategies, you'll, you know, you'll hear the music and you'll get a sense of how the Russian state media are carrying out this war on the information front. And we'll talk about how they're galvanizing support for sending Russian soldiers into harm's way and palliating economic hardship brought by sanctions and and disqualifying the censure of the world community or, or trying to do these things. Uh, I am not an expert on Ukraine and I've been very grateful to have the expertise of my colleagues like Faith Hillis, especially. Um, I've learned a lot from them and you can learn more from them about some of the, the history and, and uh, what, what I can bring is some experience looking at Russian media and thinking about it and what we do in my course, we kind of come at it from a humanist perspective and we're thinking about how images work, how narratives are structured, how the, you know, the flavor of the rhetoric um, works. And you know, sadly, you know, these things work because we can call this a kind of art, not in the sense that we usually use that term but um, there's a lot of manipulation of imagery and, and creation of imagery to produce feeling. And of course, in, in a time of a war or a conflict like this, um, feelings and beliefs are, are very important. So I'm gonna share my screen now, um, get going here. And I'm realizing, yeah, here we go. Uh, all right, sorry. Uh, everyone can see that. And if you are, um, if the screen is blocked, as it actually is on my screen by the panel of um, Zoom participants on the side, you can minimize that. If you're not familiar, you should be able to do that um, in the upper right hand corner of your screen. So um, this is probably the way that you are experiencing uh, the war from the, you know, the Western perspective. This is a New York Times story. Um, that some of you might have seen. Uh, and just note the very courageous and, and um, you know, I'd say handsome soldier there. Um, zoom in on that for a second. And then this is another uh, image from the same story. 
the author of the editorial in the background, Sudinsky in the front, and you know, we, we have all seen um, this. There's been a lot of attention to Zelensky's heroism and, and courage. And then we may have seen some images like this, where the, the common Russian, uh, sorry, Ukrainian people um, are taking up arms and you know, demonstrating their willingness to defend their country. And that is also part of this larger narrative that we're seeing about the, the courage and heroism on the Ukrainian side. So I'm not going to say anything against those narratives, but I want to just start with those to then just draw the contrast with what we're going to see on the Russian side. So um, many of you have probably heard of uh, Pierre Canal or Channel One. This is the, the sort of the main uh, state-run media outlet, and they have been covering uh, the this um, this non-war, as they uh, describe it, um, very heavily. And let's just look at the opening um, of, of one of their recent shows here. Let me just get this playing. Everyone can hear the sound? Yeah. Информационного канала. Это прямой эфир. Время покажет. С вами Олеся Лосева и Анатолий Кузичев. Продолжается специальная военная операция Российской Федерации на Украине. И вот как это происходит. Храни вас Бог, пацаны! Мы 8 лет этого ждали. Украинская армия, они вели себя здесь как оккупанты. Мы за это не 8 лет были в оккупации. Мы 30 лет были в оккупации. Вы не пострадали? Нет, нет. Конечно, надо. Как вы думаете? Мы могут наказать за то, что вы... Спасибо, что не позволили нас разбирать. Да я увидел, что здесь все платно. Спасибо, ребята, что вы пришли. Спасибо. Okay, so even if you didn't understand the Russian, you get the feel um, that you see humanitarian aid is kind of the, the theme. They're, they're coming, they're rescuing people who've been suffering, as they say, under occupation. The Ukrainian army has been, you know, keeping them in occupation for eight years. And you've probably heard repeated the word spasiba, thank you, thank you, you know, you rescued us. Um, there's, there's been a lot of emphasis upon the delivery of, of food and water. You saw someone carrying water and the child there asks, you know, about, about are they shooting? And no, we're defending. And then I also just want to point out at the very end, the host, um, if I can get this to work, um, says, Pabieda Budizanami. And this is actually a partial quote from the radio address of Vyacheslav Molotov at the beginning of the Great uh, Patriotic War, as it's called in Russia. Um, you know, our cause is just, the enemy will be defeated, victory will be ours. And this is not the only, um, you, you've probably heard about this, that's not the only kind of um, use of, of World War II language, etc. We'll, we'll watch here. This is actually um, the grandson of Vyacheslav Molotov, Vyacheslav Nikonov, who is head of uh, Russian World, Ruski Mir, which is an um, organization that promotes Russian language, Russian language education around the world. He writes textbooks. He's written a textbook of history for high school students, um, but he is also occasionally a 
um, TV host. This is the show Bolshe Igra, a big, uh, literally the big game. I'm, there's probably a better translation for that in English, but um, this is how he begins um, the, that show. We'll just play this now. Приходят очень важные события в отношении того, что происходит на Украине. Столица Украины, город Киев, заблокирован российскими войсками уже не только с Запада, но и с Востока. И Министерство обороны Российской Федерации в последние минуты сделало предупреждение всем покинуть места рядом с объектами инфраструктуры СБУ и с ретрансляционными центрами. Информационная война, которая ведется против России, будет сегодня остановлена. Есть кадры, что на Украине начинает действовать российский спецназ, а это значит, что порядок в городах будет обеспечен. Шло планомерное освобождение Харькова. Российский спецназ полностью контролирует Херсон. И сейчас вооруженные силы Российской Федерации вместе с народной милицией ДНР проводят операцию по освобождению от нацистской власти Мариуполя. Серьезные достижения и, к сожалению, киевский режим продолжает отдавать преступные приказы. На Донбассе продолжает литься кровь, идет обстрел в мирных кварталах, инфраструктура, гибнут люди. И ответственность за это несомненно, несет нынешний киевский режим. Нацистский режим, лично президент Зеленский. И эта же ответственность ложится и на те западные страны, которые делают все, чтобы это сопротивление продолжалось как можно дольше, как можно больше людей погибло, и которые пытаются поддержать эту агонию в военном отношении. Но хребет нацистской гадине, по-моему, уже... Okay, um, so that's a pretty long one. Um, I'll just try to touch on some of the key points here. So he says that the Russian forces have surrounded or they're blockading uh, Kiev from the east and the west and they're cutting off uh, communications and the information war that's being carried out against Russia will be stopped. And by that, they're talking about that. We'll see a little bit more about this, the cutting off of um, the kind of translation towers that are um, carrying the Western news signals into the region. Um, then he goes on to talk about the, um, the attempt to liberate Mariupol from uh, the Nazi powers there and the continuing criminal orders that are being issued by, um, by the, um, the government in Kiev that bears responsibility, he calls them a Nazi regime. And um, at the end, I'm, I'm feeling I'm skipping something, but at the end, he, he talks about the breaking of the back of this reptile um, of, of fascism or Nazi, Nazism, which was also, uh, it's also, uh, it resonates with, with the language of the campaign against the Nazis. Um, sorry. Uh, you, in some of the images, I'll just show a couple of stills here. This is Putin's address on March 8th, which is International Women's Day. And I, I guess the idea was to commemorate Catherine the Great in the background, but um, not lost on, on any viewers uh, in Russia would be that Catherine's role in the acquisition of the Crimea, et cetera, the expansion of Russian territory. And he, he went on to quote her that you know, even though she was not Russian by birth, that she would defend Russia to the end of her life and um, we see a lot of these. So I'm, I'm talking about World War II image, but, but we, we go a lot back to imperial images as well. And the, you can see here the double-headed eagle is, is prominently in St. George slaying the dragon, these older images of, of Russian power. And a lot of the um, media coverage you know, is focused on heroism, these kind of traditional um, values. And there's the flag with the double-headed eagle superimposed. Um, and then I, then there's the discussion of the U regime in Ukraine and particularly Zelensky. Um, 
I just pulled this up, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with, with this as well. You know, Zelensky has been really seen as a great leader at this time in the West. Um, David Remnick in New Yorker compares him to Churchill in this recent piece. Um, this is what Russian uh, consumers of Russian state television are seeing instead. Вернемся к пресс-конференции президента Украины, фрагмент, который вы уже видели в нашей программе. К общению Владимира Зеленского с прессой было приковано повышенное внимание не только из-за ответов, вопросов и планов, но и потому, что все участники и зрители заметили странное поведение лидера Украины. Он Let me try to get this. So she's saying that we're, we're going to return to this press conference by Zelensky, which you know some people noted for its content, but others noted for the strange behavior of the president, um, which then she's going to go into. Uh, here you'll get the flavor. I'm going to try to skip over the part that we already saw. Лидера Украины. Он объяснил свое состояние усталостью и недосыпом, но есть и другое мнение. Наш корреспондент Константин Панюшкин внимательно присмотрелся к мимике и жестам главы украинского государства. Так много вопросов. С самого начала пресс-конференции Владимира Зеленского для в основном западных репортеров, работающих в Киеве, стало ясно, что президент Украины вышел к прессе, скажем так, не в кондиции. И что он... Это по поводу, а что, что вы хотели еще? Получили бы достаточно оружия, чтобы избежать захвата Киева. Зеленский забывал и путал вопросы, постоянно как будто искал кого-то глазами по всему залу. Откуда-то взялась и вот эта неадекватная мимика. Он часто поправлял волосы и вытирал нос. Спасибо за вопрос. Что-то во всем этом было не то. Смотрите, звук мы умышленно заглушаем, так как слова в данном случае не важны. Президент Украины пусть и не контролировал свое состояние, но, очевидно, определенную долю неадекватности осознавал. Он объяснил поведение недосыпа. Я извиняюсь, мы спим 3-4 часа. Все нормально, я могу спросить еще раз. Нет, нет, секундочку. Говорил я с Байденом? Да, мне кажется, вчера или позавчера, я не помню. Но вот что об увиденном говорят специалисты. Нет концентрации внимания, плавающий взгляд, очень отечное лицо, опухшие веки, речь внятная, да, но он как-то тормозит периодически, потом вот он пытается найти кого-то, уходит, то есть нет такой быстроты реакции, так скажем. Вот. Здесь можно говорить, что действительно он что-то употребляет. Что употребляет или принимает, сложно сказать. Строго говоря, такое заключение в отношении президента Украины дается далеко не впервые. Зеленский регулярно появляется в неадекватном состоянии перед телекамерами и на Украине, и за ее пределами. Как-то один украинский нарколог даже анонимно опубликовал подробный разбор подозрительных особенностей поведения Владимира Зеленского и сравнил их с повадками кокаиновых наркоманов. Стимулятор вызывает быстрое переключение внимания с одного предмета на другой. В начале кокаиновой интоксикации у пациентов, напротив, можно заметить так называемый блеск в глазах. При интраназальном введении наркотика происходит раздражение слизистой оболочки носовой полости. Это вызывает повышенное выделение слизи, шмыгание, потребность дотрагиваться до носа, вытирать его. Доктор, который записал этот ролик, объявил в розыск СБУ, однако когда Зеленский еще не стал президентом, а был только кандидатом, его самого раз... Okay, um, you know, they have a medical specialist there doing an analysis of uh, Zelensky's appearance and, and suggesting that he's on something, um, taking something they talk about him being um, you know, sort of out of it. Um, and yeah, the, basically the suggestion that they make some comparisons to people who use cocaine and some of the gestures, the wiping of the nose and, you know, the um, they go on to list all of these uh, signs of drug use, you know, the wandering eyes, the swollen eyelids, the inability to concentrate, the inability to find words, etc. Um, and then she notes that, that Zelensky uh, explains that uh, by uh, lack of sleep, um, but, you know, they say that they have another um, 
more clear understanding of what's going on. Okay, let's keep going through. We have a few more here. Um, let me just get this, uh, the controls here a little. Продолжение. И поверьте мне, если они будут ликвидированы, как Шамиль Басаев и многие другие международные террористы, а именно к ним я пытаюсь это применить определение, их не надо рассматривать как политических деятелей. Это террористы. И мы с вами живем в историческом моменте, об этом нужно сказать. К сожалению, нашей страной руководили либо слабые, безвольные, или глупые, либо трусливые руководители, которые территории наши отдавали и просто разбазаривали. А иногда приходили руководители, которые восстанавливали целостность нашего государства. Вот мы живем во времена правления такого человека. Владимир – собиратель земель русских. Представьте себе, Борис Николаевич Ельцин. Вот мы тут недавно смеялись, в каком состоянии Зеленский давал интервью. А мы не помним, в каком состоянии Борис Николаевич Ельцин дирижировал оркестр? Помним. Это президент нашей был страны. Знаете, а не наш ли президент присягал, наверное, США, когда он вот, как кажется, гор... говорил, гораздо важнее. Благо... Боже, вот благослови нам, Америку, вот, это смотрите, важнее, чем Как же нам повезло, чем что сегодня руководителем страны является человек, который имеет силу воли, имеет характер принимать решения, брать на себя ответственность и давать соответствующие команды нашей армии. Если бы наша армия действовала на территории миролюбивого государства, которое не готовилось бы к вторжению Понятно. на территорию России, мы бы не России, действовали там. Мы бы уже мы бы не за три да. все закончили. Это правда. Мы бы не действовали это правда. Там. Это правда. Давайте короткая реклама, друзья, и вернемся в нашу студию. So here's where I really wish I did have subtitles for that. It's going to be hard to capture all of that. But the essence of it, um, he begins by saying that uh, there is this illness of, um, no, no, I've forgotten, Nazism, uh, but, but that, that there's, it's kind of infectious, right? And then it's spreading and that there's one um, medicine that will treat it. And, and that medicine you know, it has arrived. And of course, that is the Russian intervention. Um, and then he goes on to compare, um, he talks about uh, Vladimir, the, the, the gatherer of Russian lands. Uh, Vladimir, of course, is a, the, uh, there was an older Vladimir, uh, historic figure, but the Vladimir here is, is Putin. Um, and that he is the strong leader. And he says, you know, what if this were, what if we were living with Yeltsin? And he, he you know, so we were laughing at the Zelensky clips the other day, and it just reminded me of Yeltsin dancing on the stage um, and, and how embarrassing that was. And, you know, singing God bless America. Um, and thank God we now have a leader like Putin who has the, the strength of character to make, to carry out what's necessary um, and so, you know, this is the kind of juxtaposition that's being made between Zelensky and Putin. Now, let's look at a couple more here. Вот нацизм это очень опасная болезнь, которая настолько серьезно. Sorry, it keeps repeating. There we go. Толь Шаманов, депутат Государственной Думы, генерал полковник, герой России. Да. Позавчера я показывал положение, которое явно говорило, что Назревает формирование котла против полка Азов в районе Мариуполя, что между Харьковом, Луганском и Днепропетровском, и то, что наши войска на севере успешно блокировали крупные региональные центры. На сегодняшний день... Сложная обстановка в Мариуполе. В бессильной злобе нацисты стреляют по Донецку, э, стреляют по другим населенным пунктам, э, тем самым нанося ущерб и населению, и инфраструктуре. Но э, это и понятно, потому что для этих подонков Два направления, куда они отправятся. Первый на тот свет, и для этого будут привлечены силы специальных операций. 
Второе, это как после пленения, как военных преступников, их будут предавать суду, и они об этом знают. Тем более, что э, в фактах и свидетельств, которые Следственный комитет собрал против этих подонков, не только здесь, но и во всех остальных, и продолжают собирать, это будет тем свидетельством, которое приведут их туда, куда они стремились. So here, um, this is a, a former, um, just somebody who served in the campaigns in, uh, against Chechnya. He's the head of the State Duma um, Defense Council, Shamanov, um, speaking about the campaign and, and focusing on, in the, particularly in the last section there, on uh, the resistance, again, using these terms, uh, not, you know, Nazis. Um, and he says that they're acting with uh, this powerless wrath um, because they know that they only have two possible outcomes, either to die or to be captured and, and tried for war crimes for which evidence is being gathered um, throughout the region. And this is a, the last point that I really wanna make. Well, there's uh, maybe another one still, but this idea that, um, that there is genocide, that there are war crimes that there are going to be able to demonstrate occurred and that the Russians are coming in and saving um, the, the people from these Шаманов, atrocities. Депутат Государственной Думы, генерал полковник, герой России. Да. Позавчера я показывал положение, которое явно говорило, что назревает формирование котла против полка Азов в районе Мариуполя, что между Харьковом, Луганском и Днепропетровском uh, I think, yeah. I think, I'm sorry, that, that clip uh, needs to be re-edited, but th there's another part where he talks about um, knocking out, maybe it, maybe it's this one. Let's... Правильно сегодня было принято государственное решение по нанесению ударов по СБУ, а это главное гнездо провокаторов, и второе по телекоммуникационным телекоммуникационным элементом инфраструктуры, откуда идут и фейки, и все остальное прочее. И, как было сказано в последнем новостном блоке, что американцы отключили наши каналы, но будут и отключены нашими ударами и их каналы. Okay, I did actually have the right clip up there. So he talks about knocking out these telecommunications uh, towers, etc., and uh, that's going to stop as he you heard him use the, the english word fakes right that all this um, fake news that's being generated in the west so all of the re reportage that we're receiving here is being portrayed there in the same way that i'm portraying the russian reportage to you um and i, I want to be clear about that that um when we're talking about this you know there is this this kind of symmetry i guess and, and we've all become familiar with this in, in the age of, of Putin and Trump, you know, that there's a Fox News reality and then there's a, you know, there are other realities. But um, the consequences here are, are really significant, obviously. And um, yeah, I, the, the last piece, I'm worried that I'm taking too much time. I might not play this clip, but I might just um, give you the content from it. So this is somebody who reports, or maybe I'll just, play it and talk over it. Um, so he's reporting that he's received news from someone who's in the security um, forces or apparatus in Odessa that there's a plan to mine, a, fill a container with ammonia. And so then when the Russian troops approach the city, they're going to blow it up and accuse the Russians of carrying this out. So um, the, the same thing that's happening, I'll stop. The um, with the news, you know, it's, it's also happening. And it's just, this is another thing that I think is just really challenging, trying to figure out um, how to sort out the information that you have in the, you know, in the conditions, the, the kind of fog of war conditions, um, when it's hard to determine who's doing what. And it's clear that there are going to be attempts to charge the other side with, with doing something that, that you know, one side or the other may have done. I mean, there's another example here I have. Um, 
don't know, do I have time to play it? How are we doing? One more clip. And we're at 30 minutes, so maybe. Okay, I better stop. I better stop. But this is another one. There's a, a, a case they say that they're going to um, set fire to a, a nuclear, an experimental nuclear station and, and blame that on the Russians. Um, no, it yeah, and so um, just the last, I, I showed this image before. I just wanted to show this is from an Atlantic pic, um, pictorial. And if you read the caption here, if it's not blocked by your, um, your Zoom, um, you can see that this, is, this person is being trained by the Azov Special Operations Detachment in Mariupol. And um, I'll stop the share there if I can get my cursor in the right spot. Um, yeah, the Azov Battalion, you know, the, if, <laughs> That this is a far right group, and uh, it just it strikes me when I see these images that we we don't know enough um, to really engage in this kind of. When I see images like that, I, I um, and when I even when I watch the Russian news, I feel like I'm not well enough informed. And so, to me, the big task is going to be to try to inform ourselves better um, to to engage on this level, you know, in terms of the information. I, I mean, I've talked too long. I'm going to turn it over to Anton. Thank you, Bill. No, that was a great overview of, of what these images look like in the Russian media. It's great for American audiences also to be able to see what that looks like and, um, and to get some interpretation of it. Um, yes, I'll turn it up. And I just want to assure everyone that there'll be time for questions at the end. So please do prepare your questions in mind. And um, and we'll you know take take questions using the raise your hand function, um, and also also try to monitor the chat. Um, but I'll turn it over uh, to Anton for for your comments. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I will talk a little bit more about how Russians understand this um, uh, this propaganda, and I will try to answer the, the 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 question that I'm sure everyone has: Why do Russians believe this nonsense? Um, and this is uh, this is what we've learned. Uh, I mean, we've, we've learned that uh, even before, but more recently, we've learned that a lot of people take this more or less at face value. At, at least, what that's what they say in, in polls. Uh, that that's what they say online in social media discussions. Um, and I think there are several reasons uh, for it. And that this is based on my research, based on other people's research as well. Uh, first of all. Uh, those kinds of stories, those uh, kinds of messages really resonate with, with a lot of Russians. Mm. A lot of them were uh, and have been um, of, of mind that the West, the United States, NATO have wronged Russia and that everything is going on in Ukraine is also something instigated by, by the West. Um, this, this has been a line of propaganda for a long time, for, uh, for maybe at least, at least a decade, probably more so. And in, in general, when, when they throw uh, another outrageous story like this, um, it's, it's generally consistent with what people already know. And, and, it is, and for those people who, who generally feel that they are uh, on this, on the side of Russia in this big standoff between Russia and the West, um, this seems, well, maybe not entirely believable, but, but plausible. Um, and another thing is that what propaganda does is that it throws the, really everything it, it can think of on people. And we, we have seen a lot of cases like this uh, during this war, uh, when first they said that you know, the war is starting, not the war, of course, a special operation is starting because Ukrainians plan to attack Donbass um, and those separatist republics. And then they said that it is because Ukrainians were developing nuclear weapons. And then they said that it is because Ukrainians were developing biological weapons and chemical weapons. Now, the, the most recent thing is that they were weaponizing COVID um, and targeted it against ethnic Russians, which is uh, absurd given Putin's own statements that. Ukrainians and Russians are just one nation. Uh, there are, they, they share the same genes, but somehow Ukrainians were able to uh, create a weapon that targets Russians specifically, but does not target Ukrainians. Um, and um, this, this, is, this looks like complete absurd, but 
And the, the thing is, um, when propaganda says it uh, in this, this uh, sort of um, this constant attacks, um, some, every day something new, um, people, uh, at least those who have the presence of mind to, to watch this, um, they, they start feeling that probably there is something behind it. Maybe this particular story is not uh, correct, but there is no smoke without fire. Uh, there is uh, probably Ukrainians were up to something. We, we don't know exactly what, but they were doing something bad. And so we are, uh, we are in the right. Uh, some people, I think, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't guess, I wouldn't try to guess how many, but I'm, I'm sure there are some people who start questioning all this because this level of absurdity is, uh, is really through the roof. It's, it's even compared to what propaganda was doing in the past decade. Uh, and some people are starting uh, to question this, but um, it's difficult for them to do so because they um, because that would mean that they would admit that they were deceived before, and it's not a pleasant thing, you know, just to to recognize that all those years propaganda was deceiving you, um, and 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 right now you are, you suddenly wake up and and realize that it's not true. It's it's really hard to do. Um, so um, there is also, of course. A role that censorship plays, especially with the recent crackdown on um, Facebook, on Twitter, on basically all independent media that were operating in Russia until uh, last week. Um, so, so this plays a role, but generally most people who support Putin, most people who believe propaganda uh, would, did not watch or read those media anyway, and they dismissed all the criticisms as something that was um, instigated by the West, some sort of uh, Western propaganda, um, fifth column, and all that. And um, I think, so I think uh, eliminating those sources completely has played some role. So some people would not be able to, to watch them or read them. But I think uh, a, a more serious problem is that people who, who might have questioned this, if there was access to more independent news sources in Russia right now, so people could have thought that, well, yeah, there are others who also start questioning this. But right now, it's really hard because uh, because there is, I mean, people who, who have VPNs, people who have uh, the desire to do so, they can still access social media, they can still access uh, TV Rain or Echo of Moscow that were blocked or, uh, and eliminated recently. But um, many people won't. And, um, and some people might even think that it's it's something dangerous to do because this media will block. So uh, in that way, censorship essentially prevents people from, uh, from realizing that there are others like them who also think uh, that this, this, is, uh, this is absurd. Um, I wanna sort of stress that uh, Russian pro propagandists, they're not masterminds of persuasion. Uh, it's, it's more like they, they found a couple of things that they can do and, and, they, and they do them really well. And one of them is, just establishing what people like, what resonates with people, and creating a pretty picture around it. Um, so you've seen in the clips that that Bill showed, um, they uh, they invest a lot of in, in, a lot of resources into video production, into um, in, into you know editing the footage, uh, into having a lot of people experts around, and. Um, so, and they use, they use this to, create, to make this even more plausible to those who are already receptive to, uh, to those anti-Ukrainian messages. And the other thing the propaganda was doing and Putin was doing um, and his trolls were doing is uh, really raising uh, a lot of doubts about independent news sources, about alternative sources, um, creating this perception that everyone lies. And yes, Russian media also lie, but uh, Western media lie, independent media lie, people on Facebook also lie because everyone has an agenda. Um, and uh, if anyone criticizes this war, if anyone criticizes Russia and its actions in, in Ukraine, it's because they are against us. They want to promote some, some sort of narrative that would undermine our country. And a lot of people, again, I, I, I'm not saying that people completely believe it, but um, it's, uh, it's enough to that they that many of them have doubts. So they, when, when they see, even if someone sees those pictures of uh, bombed Kharkov, 
or uh, attacks on Kiev or, um, or children or women dying in Ukraine, uh, pe people think, well, maybe it's something fabricated, maybe it's something that's photoshopped, uh, it's constructed by Western media just to, um, just to attack us. Um, so the, the big question right now is whether, whether this could change. And generally, when people discuss this, um, they talk about two things. First, that the sanctions now are hitting harder than, than before, and that might shift people's attention from the TV screens and make them think more about their own lives. Um, but I don't know if that if, if that's going to affect what they think about Ukraine, so that they would think less about it, but I'm not sure that they would really be interested in looking for independent news sources of the situation. The other uh, factor, which is also possible, I think, is that um, as, uh, as, as more and more Russians are dying in Ukraine uh, in the war, uh, more and more bodies will be coming home and people would start realizing that this is not just, you know, this pretty um, liberation campaign where everyone just uh, greets them with flowers, but there is real resistance and um, a lot of people are dying for not, 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 not clear for what. Um, I think that that might have an effect. Um, so we saw something like that with, uh, so with the Soviet war in Afghanistan. At the same time, I want to highlight that there is uh, another factor that could go against it so, somewhat. So uh, the sanctions themselves and, and also this uh, massive turn of uh, public attitude against Russians in the West, um, to some extent might lead a lot of people who are who might be doubting this war to uh, to sort of back down and to think, well, now the whole world is against us, and maybe maybe there was it, maybe it was true what what propaganda was saying that they are they were against us uh, um, always, and they are against us now. So and what they want to do is that is just destroy Russia. So uh, to some extent, uh, this this is what. So everything that's going on uh, might uh, strangely help propaganda and, and the Kremlin to uh, to keep um, to keep people on on, on their side. Uh, now I don't I don't know whether that would have uh, such a strong effect or not. Um, we will see in the coming weeks, and I'm definitely not saying that this pressure is is not helpful. I think it is helpful, and I think it is necessary. But we should be aware of this uh, possible side effect of um, of everything that the West been, has, been, has been doing with respect to Russia. Um, yeah, I think I shall stop here and um, let people ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. And thank you, Bill, um, really for that bracing review of the contemporary Russian press. Um, I'm glad to have you use the raise hand function to ask your questions um, about the contemporary media coverage in Russia and in the US, I suppose. Um, just one, maybe a, a response to what Anton just said. I, I was just listening to Masha Gessen's interview um, on Fresh Air yesterday and um, uh, the take that Gessen gave about the sanctions that for the sanctions, of course, are just an attack, a United States attack or NATO's attack on, on Russia. So it's, it's being blamed, it's being, posited, even if the sanctions hit hard um, and prices go up everywhere, let's say, well, both, this is the US, the US has done this, the West has done this, and then see what the gas prices look like there in, in Chicago. Um, and they're doing this to themselves too. And it's this irrational Western, um, Western uh, initiated attack on the world economy. Um, Oh, and then the other thing that they uh, mentioned was this law on mass graves. And this was a quite horrifying, this was really was a terrifying um, interview um, that, that the law on mass graves was maybe part of the intent of this law was so that bodies weren't coming back home, that, that, that troops are being buried in the field. Um, I don't know if you have, can, can confirm that, that um, assertion. I mean, anyway, this is, yeah. Um, questions from, from the audience. I can ask another, I can ask one. Actually, I have one question that I wanted to um, offer both of you. I, I mean, to what extent is this media representation of the situation um, 
old and to what extent is it new? I mean, we, we thought a lot in 2016 about the echo chambers of social media, and now we have a different kind of echo chamber. And yet the, it's, it's social media specifically that's being cut off in Russia. So to what extent um, do people get their, you know, to, to what extent is the, the echo, the quote unquote echo chamber of social media um, in effect in Russia today? And to what extent is that relevant to, um, to these, these alternate realities that we're getting? What do each of you think? Well, uh, I, yeah, I'm unmuted. So um, one thing that has really struck me in terms of e echoes, and, and, and you're asking to what extent this is new and what extent it's old, um, if you read Sergei Plochi's book from 2015 um, about, I mean, uh, well, his his history of Ukraine, but the section on Maidan, et cetera, um, everything that has happened, he's talking about it then, um, and in, including you know the invasion, um, you know that was anticipated as a possibility, and Masha Gessen, I was just looking at her book, um, you know. Everything has been, you're right, in, in some sense, there's nothing new about this. What's new, I suppose, is the consequences. And I think Anton put that really well, that, you know, this, um, the, the kind of seclusive environment that people are in, they're, they're just immersed in this. And, and, and yes, I mean, what they're seeing now just resonates with what they've been being told. And it, it makes sense. It fits into a master narrative. And so it's it's not new in a way, but that's one of the things that makes it so effective. Would be my answer. Yeah, I I would agree. This uh, this is something we we've, we've, we've seen in other contexts in the United States as well. Um, this is a sort of a, an echo chamber. It's just that it's more an echo chamber of mainstream media, and it is also not it's it's not just people's choices. It's also enforced by the state to some extent. Um, that's what also makes it sort of durable, but but it is an, an echo chamber as well. Um, I, I see there is a there's a com there's a question by Angelina about where the Z came from. Um, so um, so this this is this is what this was just a mark that uh, certain uh, military units, uh, Russian military units in Ukraine used, um, and I think at first it, it was a designation of the West Military District, which is Zapad in Russian Z. Um, but it also, Z is also um, present in, in a lot of Russian slogans like Zapobedu for victory. And so uh, some, some clever person in, in, the, in the propaganda decided that they could use this um, and you know, turn it into a symbol of Russia's war. And to some extent it's, it's, it's working as uh, there are people in Russia who proudly wear the Z uh, or, you know, painted on their cars. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so I, I don't know if, uh, how successful that will be, but there are some initial successes to that uh, in terms of propaganda. And also Zamir, right? I mean, isn't that another one of the things that it's, it's said to represent? So for peace, um, which is yeah. kind of an odd war cry, but. Do we have quite other questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, yes. Um, I'm I'm here in Denver, and one of the most disturbing footage that I saw last night was a woman's a woman's body being thrown into a mass grave, and I I kind of thought that that could be used by Russia and our side to, to see how inhuman the war has made us that we are doing this mass grave burial of the dead. Uh, is that footage from our media or is that from Russia? Uh, I, I'd want to have clarification on that. Um, because it really affected me as a as a viewer, just didn't know where that was coming from. Thank you. So I'm not going to be able to answer the question factually, but I can answer it. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, the last couple of nights I've been working on getting this presentation ready. So I, I had so much footage 
And I have to say, it did not take me a long time to identify the kind of footage I was looking for. It's just, it's just right there. But I was really trying to edit it and, and, and get it ready. So I have not followed what's come out the last couple of days. But your question is, I think, you know, a really important one is how do we know uh, what we're seeing? How do we know who produced the footage you know, and, and, and for what purpose? You know, and sometimes the fakes can be, you know, uh, really clumsy. They can be shown to be from actually from another place in the world entirely. Um, and just being recycled, and you know, then then we can figure things out. But sometimes, you know, when we when we get new footage, um, it's really hard to know what we're seeing. And I, what I was trying to get at was, um, you know, that that there are clearly clearly clear, clear, clearly going to be attempts to take advantage of that on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and and when I say both sides, I don't know, that, that may sound wrong to people, but um, I mean, there's a potential to take advantage of it on both sides. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, that either side can say that the other side is doing it, right? Um, yeah, and the other thing, just we didn't get a chance to watch that last clip, but they're spending an awful lot of time talking about gathering evidence. They talk about evidence all the time, that they're, they're collecting evidence that's going to prove genocide. It's going to prove genocide. Genocide is this term that they're using constantly. And so this weird thing happening where, you know, we're talking about the very kind of information that you want being collected, but how are we going to receive Russian you know, proof of, of genocide. Um, are we going to believe it? Are we going to believe it's factual? Um, so we're in a really, really difficult position when it comes to answering questions like yours. Yeah, it is striking how, how effective, uh, you know, the last several years has been destabilizing our belief in images. Um, we have two, uh, unless Anton, you wanted to, answer the question about images of mass graves. Um, well, I think we have to we have to verify every <laughs> every image that we see. Um, well let me let me read Matthew's question in the chat then. Um, Matthew writes, yesterday it was reported that US representative Madison Cawthorn said, remember that Zelensky is a thug and remember that the Ukrainian government is incredibly corrupt and it is incredibly evil and it has been pushing woke ideologies. And he asks, how much is the Russian information operation inward facing and how much is it outward facing? Has the closure of various internet traffic reduced Russian penetration into social media? How do they reach us without those avenues? Fox News, um, great question. Does anyone want to attempt to answer yeah. that? That's a really yeah, good question. Oh. Go ahead, Anton, please, you go first. Uh, okay, so I mean, I think right now it's more inward looking, um, especially because they were uh, they themselves blocked Facebook and Twitter, um, and they have just less, few resources to to concentrate on on, on this sort of outward direction, especially as uh, they're really going against the tide here. Um, but I think to some extent it it, it is uh, there is some still some part of the operation that that tries to influence public opinion in the West, and we in these comments we we see that as uh, it, they, they could reach some conservatives here, uh, hopefully not many. And I would say that uh, in, in terms of the, in terms of how, how much uh, those blockings and restrictions um, have limited this, I, I think not, I, I'm not sure, not, I think not as much. I think it's more about the concentration of, of resources and what they, what they need to focus on. Um, and well, unfortunately, I think we will still see uh, comments like that from Representative Cawthorn and uh, I think other people, other uh, others who, who who would want to use these comments to undermine what um, President Biden do, is doing, what European authorities are doing. Um, so um, we should be really careful about um, about about comments like that about people about politicians being receptive to comments like that, I would say, yeah. I was just gonna say that I hesitated even to show that footage of Zelensky, you know, which was obviously doctored and, um, you know, made to emphasize certain aspects of the way he had behaved. And because 
you know, someone could see that and, and um, maybe I'm somehow becoming a, a vehicle. Um, I, I hope that it was not received that way here. I don't think it was for, for the most part, but. Hopefully we're framing it in a in enough context that is not so yeah. way. Yeah, um, you know, speaking of evidentiary, um, uh, you know, Evidentiary truth of uh, Christine Palmieri um, comments, I've been reading about the importance of geotagging footage in the context of documenting and proving war crimes. So to build on this question, I think this is to test this question, um, to what extent, maybe also to Matthews, um, to what extent uh, has it been possible to determine where or when the Russian footage is coming from? Maybe and also what efforts are being made to, um, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of efforts being made on Twitter to be, to to source and verify and to give people ways of um, reverse image search searching some of the searches. I think it's really important to be, to be doing that. Um, anybody have any information or thoughts about geotagging of Russian images, Russian footage? I just have anxiety about it <laughs> because I just, I think it won't take long before that, before that can be faked as well. Um, right, that you you just go in and manipulate the tags, and then it's it's just um, this is one of the things that we think about in the media class, and you know I think Anne, you probably covered this as well. It's just uh, in some ways there's no way out of this um, except through direct contact. But then you know even then um, it's hard to know what's going on around you. Just you know read War and Peace. Um, the descriptions of the battle scenes and you know it's, no one knows what's happening really pierre walks around trying to understand what's happening and, and can't yeah um well i also see we have our our um slavic librarian here I, mean, I think this is also maybe back to the question i asked about to what extent is this a social media recent phenomenon right this um the phenomenon where now images are so easily transmissible. It's different from the age of World War I when we first had photographs, you know, for the first time that were also manipulable, but now um, it's so fluid and so easy. Um, and then there are methods of authentication that we need to engage in. I mean, all the more so is that important. Um, Angelina uh, writes, uh, there's a rumor going around among Tucker Carlson fans that Putin said the current US government was illegitimate and that Trump is the real president. Well, here in our last minute of this meeting, I think um, I, th I think one of the things that I, I've learned through the course of the hour, well, first of all, how important it is to be talking about this with face-to-face -face with people who are experts in the region. I really thank Anton and Bill for bringing um, your expertise to this meeting, um, but also to recognize the extent to which this war in Ukraine is just as much a war on our perception of truth and reality. Um, and how um, how crucially important it is to be combating that, um, and that that's part of the work of institutions like Ceres, whom we thank for sponsoring this event. Um, thank you all for attending, and thank you for your questions. <laughs>